Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of The World Where We Live, winding down this uh, very tumultuous and some would say crazy, certainly unprecedented year of 2020. What a start to the decade. So in the next couple of weeks we will be having both a recap of the year's events, of which there have been many very crazy ones, and also another special on now with the benefit of seeing a year a, a year after <laughs> after when we originally planned to do this trying to analyze what the 2010s the previous decade is going to be known for besides not having coronavirus but this week we have march mallard and marto and what do we have to say about the first one March. You want to start with Ricardo March? That, that's sort of a big one. He gave his maiden speech in Parliament uh, last week, and to say that I was less than impressed would be an understatement. I think he severely denigrated the country that he has immigrated to, and he has misrepresented his facts, as shown by an article by BFG today, where he comes from a very wealthy upper class, upper middle class family and lives in a very white, nice, wealthy area. He's traveled to and from Mexico every single year since he's been here. He dropped out of university, he claims, because he couldn't afford the international student fees. It doesn't sound like that at all. And then he spent eight years as a ticket clipper at a local boutique cinema. A and projectionist. The, as a projectionist. Well, he says projectionist. Yeah. He did that for a little while, which I'm sure that he did. I don't think he's lying about that. But to, he sort of overestimated his role and I think, in general, if you can't make any progress in eight years working for one company, or at least move to a better job and get some skills and upgrades, then I think that's a pretty poor representation. And now he's in Parliament, earning $180,000 a year, bludgeoning off the taxpayer, and spouting completely irrelevant rhetoric about things that he doesn't know. He just said today, he just said today, this really got to me. He said, New Zealand Post is racist because it is based on white patriarchal systems of postal delivery. This guy is completely insane. He has no idea what he's talking did about. He and it's in Parliament. Did he expand on how that is racist? But he, said it, he said it was discriminatory against the rainbow community, which I don't understand, because he was talking about the Maori and the brown populations in New Zealand to begin with. And then he finished by talking about how it is discrimination against the rainbow community. And Listen, a, both of us are gay. Well, me, not me and Anthony. Jared's not. This is but the rainbow community, Mr. Marx. Are you listening? Are you listening to this, Mr. Marx? Do you I get your ne- mail, John? I get my mail all the time. How about I, you? I work very closely with New Zealand Post, and to say the least, they're not. They couldn't care less what your skin colour is, what your sexuality is. They're just trying to get packages out the door. Do you have any idea how much strain the network is un- at the moment? Yep. And by saying that they're sexist and racist as a government-owned organisation, isn't it your job to change that? What are you going to do about it? And I thought they liked the Labour government, and hey, they're responsible, they're the ones in charge at the moment, with a majority no less. And I think this is a a common theme among these far-left folk, there are less um, respectful names for them, but they come to these wonderful countries, they have nothing but doom and hatred to and very inaccurate statements to say about them they accuse everything of being racist everything of being sexist all these homophobic that sounds very homophobic and 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 all these all these structures that by the way have built the world as we know it the world where we live which is the most certainly the (laughs) the best world that it's ever been in all of human history so these are the best of times, and I, I feel the need whenever we whenever we hear these comments from a lot of these people who are so full of hatred that I feel the need to reinforce the fact that no, these are the best of times. This is a wonderful place we live, and Marx is. Uh, not only inaccurate, but also very disrespectful. Incredibly so, for somebody who's immigrated here and taken advantage of our fantastic country. And the whole, the whole mission statement that he's trying to propagate is that I'm a victim, I'm not getting the fair treatment, you, you're, not, you're not respecting me, you're just taking advantage of me, 
Okay, in what way have we done that? You have immigrated here, we've accepted you, you've become a resident, you are now a member of parliament, you've actually climbed the social strata and, the, and gone, gotten into yeah. parliament. That's actually not true. You haven't climbed the social ladder. You've, you've, <laughs> you, you, were already, you were already upper class, but you're, prop, you're, you're basically saying that you were lower class and now you're part of parliament. But part of a victim of a culture, man. Yeah, it's a, it's a victim of, but, he's, it's a victimized culture and that is essentially the whole LGBT community itself. At the moment, yes, but I think what this does show is that social mobility in New Zealand is absolutely possible. You've come from a foreign country, you've claimed all these things about how you had no money and you've worked in a rubbish job and you couldn't have do anything, and you've moved from what you perceive at the very least, it's absolutely not true, but you perceive yourself to be lower class, and now you're a member of parliament. I think I, I looked up actually not too long ago uh, the world rankings for social mobility and while we weren't the top option, we were definitely in the top 20. And the US and basically all other countries were lower than that. It was European countries, namely the Scandinavian countries that were top rated. Everything in, in Europe was, was high. The US was under us. I think we we're about the same as Australia. Mexico, terrible. India, absolutely terrible. China, terrible. So what's the problem? You're in the top 20 country in terms of social mobility and you're saying, we need a change. You went from a country that was lower on the scale to higher on the scale, and you're doing well. So why not focus your efforts on actually doing maybe human humanitarian aid to other countries? Surely you want to support more of the things that you're benefiting from, rather than saying mm. this is a horrible place and nobody can do anything and everything's racist and sexist and homophobic, which is obviously not true, because you're a gay man who's come from, let's say, nothing, and now you're in Parliament. 100 years ago, if you publicly came out as gay got a rod shoved up you, your ass you would be stoned yep yep or I mean it, if, as, as the further you go back the worse you were treated so we can see from history uh, actually based on what's gone on and you know everything that's happened with the Nazis and with just um, you've got like apartheid and you've got all of that minorities and people in the homosexual category have actually been treated better and better, becoming more equal, and there's, it's just on its way up. So you're saying, we're in bad times. No, we're not. Jared, like Jared said, these are the best of times. It can only get better. And that's the thing. And their idea of better is nothing to do with them. Their idea of better is the systems are put in place to give us an unfair advantage over other people. We've gone from, and take race for example, we've gone from slavery 200 years ago segregation 50 to 100 years ago and in the modern age it's we have to have laws that force people to give preferential treatment to certain races and mm. if you don't enact those then you're a racist Maybe it's gone beyond equality it's gone full circle back claiming to racism exactly yeah. claiming an unfair advantage over others I've always, not down for that I've always said in the past as well you can't fix racism with more racism and you can't fix inequality with more inequality and that's what the Labour government's trying to do and the Greens and anyone who purports to saying we need to change things we need to give these groups more rights remove barriers rights. remove barriers <laughs> don't put up more barriers because I, I agree. Hundred years from now, I wouldn't actually. It couldn't. You couldn't go so far to say. Well, you could go so far. Go so far to say that the white people could be oppressed. Could be. It could be. And but would you say, oh, it serves them right? I think. Or what, would you say that's? I think what you're trying to problem. get at really is the same point that I always come to, and I always ask people on the left and the right. And is it equal on both sides? And the question you ask them is, would you give your worst enemy the powers that you're requesting? And right. if the answer is no then perhaps you should rethink the powers that you're requesting because inevitably it will come round to bite you in the ass. Exactly. And I don't know what their end game is. Um, some kind of, well, the, the Green Party especially, they seem to be the sort of decolonialist, whatever that means, um, basically ruin everybody's livelihood in the name of environmentalism. And it's always it always comes down to people who want to force others to make sacrifices and to do the hard work 
while they can sit by and not do anything. Mr. Marx, oops, I mean March, you are an aristocrat now. You are one of the powerful. You may have been back home and you uh, did a very good job sort of uh, pushing that under the rug, but I hope you use your powers wisely because there are people who are listening to your hateful rhetoric and they will be inspired by it. For anyone's for anyone's reference, anyone who hasn't watched the speech or read the recent I think BFG or BDFG yeah. article, um, he had the ability while here as an immigrant, claiming not to be able to pay for university, to visit uh, Mexico. I believe it was seven times. Yep, every year. Every year, essentially. Um, that's such an insane expense, and it was during uh, peak holiday seasons as well. Um, so if anything, please turn over your finances and explain why you're disadvantaged. And, uh, yeah, that's quite a lot of CO2 you put in the atmosphere there, mate. Especially um, for the Greens Party. Yeah, mm. certainly. Environmentalists, are we? So, uh, another, speaking of another member of Parliament making a fool of himself, Trevor Mallard. What do we have to say all, about all, all the time, mate. Him. All the time, mate. Duck shooting, se shooting season is open now, isn't it? I think that's the best comment that I've seen on Facebook so far. <laughs> Duck shooting season's coming early. The, the Speaker of the House needs to go. If there was a way that I could sign a petition to get rid of him immediately, that's exactly what I'd do. I mean, to, to, to be fair <coughs> to... Well, I mean, I, I shouldn't be fair to him. He, he's so done pl he, plenty... He, he wasn't fair he's on the done, man here. He hasn't accused. been fair, but, I mean, we can say for short certainty that this get rid of Trevor Mallard stuff is coming up just because mostly of that... Um, Fake rape, rape clay case. False rape accusation. Yes, exactly. However, we need to look at the past and actually look deeper into it. One of the main issues with Trevor Mullard is he's extremely biased. Extremely. He is always defending the leftist agenda, Labour Party, and a speaker should not be biased. So not only should he be removed, and he should be removed, shouldn't be, be resigning, remove him, he should rem be removed because he's biased, he's spreading disinformation, he's and incompetent. He, he is incompetent, he's wasted our money, he's got to go. They're spending $330,000 to on the taxpayer's budget to deal with the defamation claim that he just had made against him, which is absolute defamation as well. And we don't have to say allegedly, because this is now finished in court. He's sit this is being settled. This is this is absolutely insane. This is this is his cost. Why is this my cost? Exactly. I mean, he should pay for it out of his own pocket. We we live in a country that is uh, has become awfully, I guess, apathetic to blatant conflict of interests. I mentioned this sometime during our election pod, one of our election podcasts, that uh, Jacinda Ardern's personal bodyguard is mm. married to Jessica Much Mackay, who is also one of Jacinda Ardern's personal bodyguards. One protects her from physical threats, the other protects her from threats in the form of tough questions from the media. So this is nothing new, these conflict of interests. Trevor Mallard is partisan. He is certainly not impartial. He never has been. And he has made an absolute and utter disgrace of himself. Right. I propose a motion right here and now that I mean, Labour's going through selection posts to select the next Speaker of the House, which they're going to do from their internal party. So I propose a motion right now that when you select the Speaker of the House, if you're the party that has got the current government, you must select somebody from a party that is not part of your government. I think that would make things a bit more partial and a bit more fair and a bit more interesting, actually. If, you, if Labour had to pick somebody from National or ACT, that would make something really interesting. Or, or, or you should have a, a method in which everyone votes on it in the House and there has to be a majority rules, which means it needs to work across both sides of the bench. Labour would just be able to pick their speaker right now, though. because Majority rules, though. Let's just say it's 90%. No, yeah, but it's 50. Oh, no, that's uh, entrenched. Yeah, you can't have policies based on trade. Picking, picking one outside the party, what if they picked Mr. March? Oh, go for it. Go No, seriously, go for it. Pick somebody that's not in your party. Maybe he will do a better job of holding Labour to account. 
maybe he literally will. Maybe. But, well, but would they? <laughs> but as long, as long as he doesn't make any false rec or Colin Colin Forbrick, or yes. Judith Collins, or Simon Bridges, or yeah. so any Damien Smith from the ACT Party. Go, Damien. He'd Let's be a forget speaker. that this person, the Speaker of the House, and any member of Parliament is a public servant. They're not your boss. They're not your dictators. They're public servants. We, the taxpayer, we, the people, are paying for them. And it's in your right, it's your right to protest his position in government. So I endorse anyone who, in any shape or way or form, goes and puts out their voice out there and says what they think of Trevor Mallard. Right. We should go ahead and look at new candidates. He's been there for 30 years. And we've only just speaker. seen, we've only just seen a little bit of what he's done. We've, we've what if we cross-examine the entire 30 years? What else has he done? A he lot. can do this. He can be biased in this way and he can make fake accusations. What else can he do? do One example, you know, sorry, is uh, I read there was a, an act about um, like ticket management, ticket and event management. And he passed that in like 2006 or 2007. He put that through. And in 2012, he went and bought some tickets for this event and then he went and sold them for it profit purposes. It was the anti-scalping bill. Mm. It was a scalper. Yeah. So he, he, he $249 from Yeah, money. exactly. So he, he knows... He gave the money back, apparently, though. So, he, like... He knows... He oh, knows he what... Caught. He knows what... Gonna s give the 333000 back, I wonder? He if you want to go and help with this, go and look up the Taxpayers Alliance and go and sign their petition because they've got one going at the moment. Mm. It's interesting because that's what we need. We, it's the grassroots movement. It's the will of the people. It's we the people. And if you get enough people who are going out on the streets calling for his head, yes, he will be forced to resign simply because he'll lose all of his credibility. I don't really think it, if he stays, he will have much credibility. I think... Uh, and I was even thinking that possibly... If anyone in Parliament right now disapproves of him refusing to resign, don't show up to Parliament. Just don't show up to work. Stay outside, you know, make, have your meetings through Zoom or email or anything, and don't face him. And do that because you don't believe he's worthy to be the Speaker of the House. That's your protest. And if you do that long enough, yeah, someone will have to... I, I would go there. one step further than that, and I would encourage all MPs that do not support Trevor Mallard to completely ignore every single thing that he says and just sit in Parliament and do your job and have your speech. And if he tries to shift you down, do not tolerate this any longer. Pretend he doesn't exist. He, he has He's undermined his own credibility. They can't, they can't remove every MP. If you have 30 or so, 40 all MPs... National, all that. If you have all of National and all of Act, by the way, who are all calling for Trevor Marlott to stand down, what can you do if each and every one of them, under a coalition, joint effort, refuse to adhere to his instruction? It'll, it'll boost their voter numbers, it I'm sure. It'll be, a, it'll be a grandiose action, and it'll be quite respected by people who are tired of this sort of stuff being forced through the government and being bullied. Have you? Uh, it, it is literally bullying. And have you he's, seen he's against all this stuff as well. It, he gives Hypocrite. preferential speech treatment and yep. and rights to people who agree with his agenda in the parliament. People like David Seymour and national MPs are cut short or disallowed just questions. disallowed questions. Um, he allows our Labour MPs to not fully answer questions. Um, he's their lackey. He's he a bodyguard. Th this is why I think you should split from a party other than yours. Exactly. exactly. You're bringing in the, the voice of the other side. Yeah, and literally. if there's one thing we need more in politics, uh, New Zealand and elsewhere, <coughs> America, <laughs> it's the voice <coughs> of the other side being heard and being respected. Just, just very, very quickly, and I don't really want to get into the subject, but shout out to Joe Biden. You've won the election now, mate. Well done. Let's see what you do with it. Don't mess it up, mate. Well, he will, but... Whatever. We'll Good luck. He's he's already he's already turned down Antifa and he's disowned Antifa. Black Lives Matter is next. Exactly all what all the right and the Republicans have said for ages is going to come to pass. You guys that support Biden are about to get stomped. You well, know the thing. Let's just um, let's also just say congratulations to Harris on her future appointment as president That's when Joe be Biden minutes, isn't it? eventually dies in probably a year. So.
Ahuia Martel. I believe that's how you pronounce it. That's what we broke down, isn't it? Sure. We did look up the phonetic pronunciation. We of that. did. Google's useless at that. You'd think they're, you know, they're the progressives. They should be able to pronounce things correctly. But I digress. Marto Martel has, uh, it well, is going to be bought back with taxpayer money, and this sets a dangerous precedent. Like you've never seen, mate. Like you've never seen. This undermines fundamental property rights in New Zealand. That your building purchased that land, they paid a fair price for it, they paid a fair market value for it, they're going to develop it, and because some protesters turned up and did a sit-in, which is, it's been reported in the news as an eviction, but what they're really doing is trespassing. You can't be evicted you can't be if evic you don't live there. You don't live there, this, they're the, not They're comparing this with Bastion Point. No, it is not like Bastion Point. Bastion Point was government land, and the point is they wanted to sell it. It was their decision whether they did or not. This Ahuya Martel is private land. It does not belong to any of those protesters who were going there. It was paid for, bought, fairly under New Zealand law by Fletcher Building. Fletcher Building at the time agreed not to build anything near the or what we can what can be discovered as the burial sites and also earmarked a large proportion of it to be social housing to help those communities who didn't and like the idea. provide thousands of jobs to the local community. So property rights losers Everyone who is going to get a job loses. Everyone who's going to get social housing loses. And who's winning out of this? Nobody who's winning wins. out of this? Nobody the taxpayers wins. losing because we're going to have to fork out a bunch of money to pay off what is one of New Zealand's largest companies. And the are you kidding me? The people who get the handouts, people who were just given something for nothing, they lose because it makes them weaker and less likely to be able to get out of this big government welfare system and getting given stuff for free. If anything, you're contributing to the perceived, uh, well, maybe maybe not perceived. There is a, there is some problems in terms of um, how much money is put into welfare and that sort of stuff. But you're taking money out of um, the system that could have been better spent on things like hospitals, it could have been spent on infrastructure, whatever. You're now giving it to a private company that actually was going to do a lot of good and instead the government's just going to buy it and who knows what they'll do with it. They'll probably just be like, oh, here's just a national park. And what do national parks contribute? Absolute F all usually. Do, do we know off the top of our heads sort of approximate value? Are we talking like 10, 20 million? It's going to be millions. It's going to, it's going to be in tens of millions. So you tell me how many heart surgery operations and hip operations and diabetic treatments and broken bones that could be fixed for? Thousands. 10 to 20 million. Thousands. You better know. Thousands. It. It's, that's absolutely And insane. do you know how long the waiting lists are for those? Oh, well, how many COVID patients could be saved? Well, there Seriously, are, well, we, we just locked down sorry, the entire economy. No, sorry. What do you mean COVID patients? There well, aren't any. There's six at the moment. There's six in Auckland. <laughs> oh, there's six. six in Auckland. Well, as of well, Tuesday, I think, there were six in Auckland. Yeah. Right. So what's their medical treatment costing? And how many of those patients could be treated better and survive more? What about the 23 COVID patients that died? Could we have better treated them instead of spending this money on the Fletcher building? Let's not let's not talk about COVID. It's opportunity cost is what I'm exactly, getting Exactly. That is that is right. There is an opportunity cost to what the protesters have done here. And whether or not they had an ulterior motive, um, you know, beyond what they claimed was a cultural issue. Well, well, I don't we'll, think so. we'll we'll never know. But banging your feet together and, and complaining about something that really at the end of the day wasn't going to affect you negatively it was going to benefit you is just it just shows how like lack lacking these people are in understanding of how um, development and certain things work and I mean maybe it's a greater issue of these people just stuck in their ways or maybe it's a real education problem and yeah that's the thing it's just I suppose it undermines the fundamental property rights in New Zealand. It opens up to squatters coming and mm. sitting on your pre-purchased, your already purchased land, like Shelley Beach. They're going to be emboldened by these tactics. I'm not angry about this. The reason I'm not I'm angry, angry about, about it, man. this is because so the government's going to pay them off. But I've come to realise 
When government's involved, and this is a classic libertarian perspective, when government's involved, especially Labour or the Greens, and or, and or the Greens, you can consider that taxpayer money to be squandered. Mm. They'll squander it on Mato. Yeah. They'll, if they weren't going to do that, they'll squander it on something else. Some of those government projects they've embarked on are utterly ridiculous. They benefit either nobody, really, perhaps the people who are told they're benefiting don't realise that they're not being benefited, welfare dependency, etc. But really, that however many million dollars, that would have been taken and squandered in some other way. So really, when taxpayer money goes to the government, it's a bit like if it goes to Auckland Transport or Auckland Council, we can consider it squandered. It doesn't matter. It's because government is inefficient. Ab- abstractly speaking, I know you talked about this just a little bit then, what do you think that the protesters were thinking at this time and what their goal was? What, what do you think was their intended goal, their, in, their perceived benefit? What, what do you personally think that they were trying to achieve um, by doing this? Well, the way I understand it, they, they subscribe to cultural and traditional values that, that see land as something sacred, yeah. just in its, in its existence. Generally agree, though. Okay. They, oh, certainly. Except they'd laugh at us if we said, look, I don't want them building houses on my favourite childhood park. They would think that's a, a stupid thing to, to, to say. Uh, yet, so by, they so follow the same logic themselves. But I don't know what the end game is. I certainly don't see anything logical. Really, if you were to just snip off large tracts of land and outlaw any development on them or any building on them for ev- forever and all eternity, well, forever until I guess we're the human race becomes so there's so much into, um, interracial uh, breeding that we're I, a post race society and sh- sure. no culture matters Wait, that, that's kind of inevitable I, th- I think I touched on this uh, uh, the last podcast that we did I think I touched on this this is, this is the whole problem up with Northland they're, they're keeping everybody poor in their own communities they're keeping everybody poor permanently because they want to control them because they won't let any development of land happen they won't let any of mixing of land happen. There is too many trustees and too many vested interests in this, and trying to hold land and property in this way is absolutely terrible for property rights because there is no one defined owner of that specific area of land, and they cannot use it to trade and generate income for themselves. And you can do that in a sustainable way, but they're disallowed from doing that. The same thing's happening here, except now it's at our expense. It's at your expense. We're paying for this. And they are going to get to control what our resources that we have put our labour in now do. So now, just in response to what you were saying, I'm trying to think of this as from a legal point of view in terms of um, arbitrating both sides of the issue. Now, we can... need to be arbitrated. But it's we very can, clear. We, we can, okay, so we can agree that you said that land is sacred and that's their reason... So if land is sacred, we can agree that land has inherent value. Land is a commodity. It can be bought, it can be traded. That's what we can agree. So therefore, land should be available to people to be purchased privately. And you know, if it's private, you have rights. Okay. So if we think back, their claim is they owned that land hundreds of years ago, and then it went through changes of ownership, what, what, whatever. Does their claim to the land... Um, that it was, it should be rightfully owned by the Maori people. Do you think that that is legitimate? Should it have gone through the judici- the judicial system? No. Or is it actually just too late? It can't actually Absolutely be acted upon. The property rights in that land have already been settled, and that property was then sold to Fletcher Building via our property rights system. Okay. What is currently happening at the moment is undermining our property rights system by telling people that if you have some kind of claim that you are completely making up, mm. even after a treaty settlement, you can go back and petition the government by being a trespassers on that land and then have the government return, steal that land by force from the rightful property owner and return it to you at the taxpayer's cost. But don't, but don't you think that... Um, from a from a legal point of view, 
you know, if it did become a, a legal dispute in the, the court of law, that it could be within the grounds to be no. It wouldn't. It wouldn't be black nope. and white. It would be one hundred percent more interpreted. No, one hundred. I'm just trying to see the other side of the argument. If there was actually a substantiated <coughs> claim where it could actually be if investigated, if there was a substantiated claim, they would have gone to court. Yep. But there is no substantiated claim, and they have so, no standing because they do not own the property, so that's nor their previous owners of the property. So that's exactly right, which is what I was trying to prove. Which is, if there was no claim, what the government has done here is considered unlawful. We may not understand the cultural specifics, nor what may we have any actual reason to. All we need to understand are the economics of it. They haven't changed since they were discovered in... Was it 100 years ago now. 100, 100 years, years ago. ago. Yeah, probably... Uh, John Locke. Exactly. So, thank you very much for tuning in. This was another episode of The World We Will Live. What a hectic week, what a hectic year. We're all just going to be glad when it's over. We will see you next week for a roundup of 2020 events, which is going to be great fun because everybody else is doom and gloom. And despite us being a little bit, uh, I don't know, dark, shall I say, I've actually had a great year. It's actually been really fun. This is the best year ever, despite all the things that have gone on and the COVID crisis and everything else. Suffering builds character. Oh, look, everything is better now than it has ever been before, and it will continue to get better. Let's just say that this year will be one remembered for decades to come, and it will be a turning point in our history, better or for worse, that's yet to be determined. And I'll leave you with another Christmas joke, because we can't get enough of those. Oh, dear. Did you hear about the dyslexic devil worshipper? He sold his soul to Santa. Good night, everybody.